Welcome today, everybody, to our wonderful service. Thank you so much for joining us. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you, um, if not in spirit. Um, we hope that today this service is a light of hope for you, um, that as we talk about Jesus, as we talk about God, what he has done for us, what he continues to do for us, that that will be some hope, a little bit of light in our life at the moment. So come, let us stand together in spirit as God's one church and praise him. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that may Heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together. Let 
Just worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great
more than the song I sing, more than anything, I need you more, more than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than anything, I need you more, I need you guilt, the fear could all be cast aside if they called upon your name, Jesus. If they were to bow down before you, Lord, kneel in front of you and give their life to you, Jesus. Because we might not know the words to say, Lord God, we might not know what we need, I know what we want, God, but we don't know what we need, but Jesus, you do. And you are more than capable of providing that for us if we, if we would just ask God. So Lord, in a world of pain, of fear, of uncertainty, particularly at this time, Jesus, bring your peace. Rest in the knowledge that you hold everything, that you are with us in every moment of our lives. You were there, Lord, at the beginning of the year. Lord, you will be with us. You are there right now at the end of the year, God, and further, and you are here right now. Lord, make your presence known to us. Holy Spirit, fill us with your life, with your love, and with your joy that we may show other people what our God is truly capable of. The power, the majesty, and the mercy that He holds for us. Lord, speak to us, Jesus. Be with us. Holy Spirit, fill us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. G'day and welcome to our worship time today. I want to say thank you for joining us and for being a part of our church family. We recognize that at least in the days we're living in at the moment, our experience of fellowship and our experience of, of being the church of the body of Christ is a whole lot different to what we are used to. We gather online. We view um, a service from a distance. We're not in the same place together. At least that's how it is for now. But what is most important is that if you are with us, we want you to feel that you are welcome and that you belong. You belong because God loves you and God welcomes you. And in the same way, we love you and we welcome you as well. So thank you for spending this time with us today. In order to help our experience of fellowship and being together, um, uh, on our website, you're going to find uh, a place where you view our service. You'll find the address on the screen in front of me right now. You're going to find a place there where you are able to indicate that you're here with us. 
And I want to invite you, in fact, I want to ask you, would you please sign in? If it's your first time, it's easy to find. There's a place there you can indicate this is the first time that you've signed in on our website. Or even if you're returning, you're um, back for another visit or you're part of our church family um, that would regularly gather with us here. Uh, I want you to indicate that you have joined us today. There's also a place there where you can indicate if, um, if you'd like us to pray for you. You can put in a prayer request there as well and, uh, and we'll keep that confidential, but it will enable me to pray for your needs and your thoughts as well. And there's even a place there where you can conveniently worship by bringing your tithe or offering. So please take advantage of that place and that, that, that page. Today, um, as you record that you are with us, it'll also help me because what I want to do um, is I want to send each person that indicates they're here just a, uh, an email uh, with a, um, some questions that will follow on from the message that we are going to be looking at and focusing on today. And it'll just give you an opportunity that maybe uh, during some time during the week, you can reflect and think back over the, the passage of Scripture, and there's some, a bit more Scripture in there as well for you to look at, and that you can meditate and remember the things that we have uh, talked about and some ways of putting some of those things into practice if they're helpful uh, to you. Whatever happens, I hope and pray that today is a special day for you and that as you worship with us, you'll experience the presence of God, you'll experience his love and that you will know that we're here with you supporting and praying for you as well. I want to draw your attention to two other things. One is again on our website, on the, on the front page, on the home page there. During the week, I wrote an article. There were some quite remarkable things that have been happening in our world today. Things that line up with what the Bible says. And I took some time to, to, to write that out and people have found that interesting. Some have asked questions, some have challenged some of the things that I've said and sent me emails. But I would want to encourage you to have a read of that, particularly if you're feeling life, tough, uh, life is tough at the moment, but even, even more, because I believe we're living in a time when the, when the Word of God, when the Bible is coming alive, the things that the prophets wrote so many years ago, uh, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago even, are coming um, to light just right before our very eyes. And so I've outlined that for us as well. And I would encourage you to have a read of that and also to respond. Let me know what you think, if it's helpful or maybe even if it's not. That's okay too. I just love getting the feedback. The second thing I want to bring your attention to is that uh, tomorrow night or Monday nights from 7.30 to 8.30 every week at the moment while we're in this lockdown period that we're having here in Melbourne, uh, we're going to gather together for a prayer meeting and I want to invite you and encourage you to join with us. We'll spend a little bit of time reading the Bible together and then praying together both for our own needs and of course the needs of the world around us. And so if you're not sure how to get hold of that, um, send me an email, I'll send you the link so that you can join join with us on Monday night. We're going to read uh, from God's Word right now. And in fact, what we're doing now is we're beginning a new series. This new series that we're beginning together um, is going to be looking through the wonderful book or the epistle, the letter to the Hebrews. And uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more about uh, what our focus is going to be as we look through this, uh, this particular book and as we go through this series uh, together. But I want to invite you to open your Bible and, uh, and open up to Hebrews chapter 1, right at the very beginning. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And we're going to read that together now. It begins like this. Long ago... God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's glory, God's own glory, and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. 
This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. Why don't we pray? Our God, we want to thank you for your precious word, and we thank you that it encourages us and it strengthens us. And as we come to read and to study your word together today, we just humbly place ourselves and surrender ourselves into your hands. And we invite you to speak to us. We invite you to encourage us and strengthen us and to challenge us. Lord, that you would help us to become the people that you've created us to be. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, last year a friend of mine invited me to come to his place to use the equipment in a a gym that he had prepared and he had built in his garage. It spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, and quite a lot of money, I reckon, in building this excellent home gym. But even more than all of that, he had invested a lot of time in studying in order to be able to help himself and to help to train others in how to use that equipment both well and in a way that would benefit, but also in a way that would be safe for us to do so. And I was encouraged to come and to join with him and a small group of people that would use that gym throughout the week. To begin with, I thought it would be fun. It'd be a good alternative. I enjoy um, activity. I play tennis. I uh, recently took up running and, uh, and I try and keep fit and I enjoy that. It helps me physically and I also find that it helps me mentally. And so I thought that spending time in the gym would be a good alternative to the other activities that I was doing. There was also another benefit that I was looking forward to, an opportunity to get to know Stephen a bit better as well. And all of those things I was able to do, but I discovered that it helped me also in a surprising way. As I just said, I've been running probably now for about three years, and I've managed to build myself up to a level where at least once every week, I will do a 10 kilometer run. I'd never run 10 kilometers in my life prior to this. So I felt even that was quite an achievement for me. Some weeks I'll run more often than just that one 10 kilometer run. Sometimes I'll even try and run longer distances. But I find that on a regular basis, 10K is a good distance for me. I can do it in a little under an hour and uh, and it's a good time. And I I am able to put um, a fair amount of effort into that. I got myself to a pace that I was, I was relatively happy with it. Uh, I don't do it competitively. I do it for the enjoyment of it and I do it for the, uh, for the personal development um, as I was talking about. So I was quite comfortable with what was happening. There seemed to be kind of like this ceiling that I had hit in terms of the time that I was able to kind of almost touch, could almost get under this time. And, uh, but only then on very good days. However, what I discovered was something really interesting. I'd just been spending probably about six weeks, maybe a couple of months in the gym with Stephen. And all of a sudden I discovered one day that I was able to go better. I could go above that ceiling that I thought was my limit. And not only that, The next week I ran my 10 kilometers and I backed it up. I broke that ceiling, I I went faster again. And on the third week, I was able to do the same. You see, what I had discovered was, was that building muscles had been a key in order to help me achieve better and to achieve more. So building muscle is good. We can read about that and we discover that studies show that muscle building exercise does lots of good for us. It improves our balance. It reduces the likelihood of falls, particularly those of us that are getting older. It improves our blood sugar control. It improves sleep. It improves our mental health. And of course, on top of that, for those whom this is a positive, like it certainly was for me, weight loss becomes a benefit as well. So it's good to build our muscles. Why am I saying this? What's the relevance of that to Hebrews chapter one? Well, the relevance is this. 
we have a spiritual muscle. That spiritual muscle is our faith. And we can work on our faith. We can build up our faith in a similar, similar way to the way in which we build up our physical muscles. So today, as I said before, we are beginning a new series. We're going to be studying through the book of Hebrews. And as we do this, we're going to see lots of amazing things. It's a wonderful book, surprising things, incredible things that help us in our day-to-day -day living, in our faith journey with Jesus. But as we study this book, we're going to be, and with all the things that we learn, we are going to be paying particular attention to building our faith. We're going to be in the faith gym, if you like. You and I are going to be looking to develop a ripping faith. So that's the title of our series. How do I build a ripped faith? We hear, to, we hear people talk all the time about a, a ripped body. Well, we're going to be developing a ripped faith. I know I cringe a little at that title as well, just like I cringe a little at the ripped body phrase. But you know, the more I looked into this, the more I studied this, the more appropriate that title and that word ripped was to what we're speaking about. I studied and discovered that getting a ripped body is not just about building bigger muscles. It's also about what we take away from around the muscles. It's removing fat so that the muscle is more defined and easier to see. I'd say that there's probably some fat that we should be removing from around our faith muscles as well in order that our faith would be more defined and more easily seen. And so I'm going to ask you this question. Are you ready? Are you ready to get a ripped faith? Let's get into it. Well, the first way or the foundational way that we have in order to develop a ripped faith is to have a healthy and growing understanding of God and growing in relationship with Him. It's not just about knowledge. It's about relationship. And all through today, we're going to be talking about how those two go hand in hand, understanding and relating to God. And the four verses that we've read together today make it perfectly clear that everything that we could ever possibly need in order to be able to know God is within our reach. No matter who we are, we can know God. We can grow in understanding. We can grow in knowledge of Him. And importantly, as I said then, we must grow in relationship with God. Doing those things, growing in knowledge and understanding, growing in relationship, is the foundation. It is the first step, the foundational step to building our faith, to developing a ripped faith. Many of us know and love the Narnia series. You know, the books by C.S. Lewis, The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, and there's five others in the series as well. Well, in the book Prince Caspian, the four central children that um, came in, The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe, while it's not the first book in the series, it's the one that uh, many people have gone to first. And, and these four children are being come into this, this, this wonderful land, a, a different world, a place called Narnia. And in Prince Caspian, they're called back into Narnia to help restore the country to its former glory. Lucy is the youngest of these children. She was the first person to discover this land of Narnia of all of her brothers and sisters. When she comes back in, in, in the story of Prince Caspian, she's been there for a while and she's been looking and hoping to meet her beloved Aslan. And finally, she sees him for the first time in over a year. It's been a while. Now, for those of you who know the books and the movies, you will know that Aslan is the lion. He is the great ruler. He is the creator. He is the one who created Narnia and um, many other worlds in the story. 
Well, the moment Lucy looks up and sees Aslan there, her heart is filled with joy and she runs to him and they embrace again. And uh, there's just this lovely little moment. And then she kind of pauses and she steps back and, 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 and with, with these words of surprise, she looks at Aslan and says, but Aslan, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one, answered Aslan. Lucy is a little confused. That's not because you are, Aslan? I am not, he says. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. C.S. Lewis, who writes these books, is a Christian author. He's a theologian. He studied and taught in Oxford University um, over in England. And in writing these books, while they might be children's stories in a sense, he looks for ways to um, share his understanding and his knowledge of God. And you see pictures of God and his theology, his understanding of God all throughout these stories. And in the series, Aslan is a picture of Jesus. And here he is making a point, a point that I believe is very well made. He's saying that the more we grow in our knowledge and our understanding and our relationship with Jesus, the bigger Jesus becomes in our eyes, in our sight. And I think it's a great point. It's, it's something that I have seen and experienced as well. I remember many years ago when I first went to Bible college, my friends and uh, people around me, they'd come and they'd ask, hey, Brad, how's it going? What are you learning? What, what's, what's happening for you? Are you enjoying it? And there were always lots of things that I could share about my experience. But I remember one thing that really stood out to me at the time. And that was, and I remember saying to people, the more I learned about God, the more I discovered that there was more to know. It was just like Lucy's experience with Aslan. As I grew in my relationship with Jesus, as I grew in my knowledge of him, he just kept getting bigger. There was always more to know and to discover. And that growing knowledge and that growing relationship with Jesus is foundational if you and I want to build our faith. And all of that is possible because the Bible teaches us that God has made himself known to us. If you went to Bible college like I did, you, the, the teachers would tell you this is called divine revelation. It's the way God reveals himself to human beings, to you and I. And the way God keeps on revealing himself, the more we grow in knowledge and in relationship with him. In Romans chapter 1, we read the first way, the foundational way that God reveals himself to all people. No one is excluded in this. And it also says that no one has any excuse as a result if they do not recognize that he is God and they do not honor him and worship him as such. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, For ever since the world was created... People have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. The psalmist in Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. The vastness and the precision of space, the universe, it's a masterpiece that demonstrates beyond question the creative activity of a magnificent God. You may have heard of Kepler. He was a renowned scientist, lived a few centuries ago. He was known as the founder of modern astronomy. He's the man from whom we get the term satellite. 
He was noting the magnificence and the order of the universe when he said these words. The laws of nature are within the grasp of the human mind. God wanted us to recognize them by creating us after his own image so that we could share in his own thoughts. Interestingly, Kepler said something else. He said this, he said, the undevout astronomer is mad. You see, to him, as a, a student of God and a student of the universe, it was obvious, it was that obvious. In his own mind, anyone who studies the universe is immediately confronted by the creative activity of an intelligent being who is infinitely greater than the human mind. And that space, that, that area, that, the place in which we dwell is there all the time, pointing to the reality of the existence of God. But you know, we have more than revelation in creation to teach us about God. That only goes so far. In the very first verse of Hebrews that we've read together today, this is what the writer declares. He says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. The emphasis of the writer here is he's talking about the diversity of the way God has chosen to speak or to reveal himself throughout the Old Testament scriptures. He's telling us that God went to great lengths, used incredible illustrations in order to get his message across. He used prophetic men and prophetic women in order to do that. Here's an example of just some of the ways that God did that. When you think about Moses and the Israelites when they came to Mount Sinai, the place was full of thunder and lightning and the voice like a trumpet. That was how God was communicating to them on that occasion. But when Elijah was up on the mountain, some centuries later, this time it was a still small voice. The loud things, the thunder and the lightning, they were, uh, they, they, he couldn't hear the voice of God in that, but it was the still whisper of God that he spoke. God also used visions for many of the prophets, like the prophet Ezekiel. He used dreams to speak to other prophets like Daniel. To some, he would use the direct approach. He would send an angel, a messenger to speak to them. To others, God himself would appear to them personally in human form. And then having received the message, the, the prophets were then instructed to deliver it, to pass that on to others. And they did it in even more creative ways. Amos, who was a prophet, he gave direct oracles. Malachi, he, he did a surprising thing. He used questions and answers. Ezekiel was probably more bizarre than most. He used captivating and, and very strange symbolic acts in order to pass on the message from God. Haggai, he preached sermons. I like his style. Zechariah performed mysterious signs. But what was interesting and what was important that all throughout all of this, wherever the prophets spoke or acted in order to pass on the message, God authenticated the message by miraculous acts in order to get their attention and to prove that the message was from God. For example, when, when, when Moses came speaking the words of God, God gave him ways to testify to that, ways that authenticated and proved that he wasn't speaking just the words of a man, but he was passing on the message from God. And the significance of all of that is this. God will go to great lengths to communicate to us. God will go to incredible lengths in order to communicate to you. God's message is never boring. It's never beyond comprehension for someone who is willing to, to listen and to humble themselves before God. God's message is never irrelevant. It's always on time. It, 
And, and every time God comes and speaks to us, it's like he reveals a little more of himself to us, but he never contradicts anything that we know of him in the past that has been correct. Through revelation via creation that we spoke about first, through the prophetic word that we've just spoken about now, men and women rose to a life of faith at at the highest level. I mean, you think about Abraham and everything he achieved through faith. You think about Moses and how he overcame the mightiest empire on the planet at the time. You think about how David slew Goliath. And I love to think of Daniel. I mean, he was a man who was taken off in captivity and, and, and yet he maintained his integrity. But more than that, I mean, he lived and served under one of the most wicked emperors of his time. And not only did he survive that, but have a read of Daniel chapter four. His actions and his example and his faithfulness to God turned the heart of the dictator Nebuchadnezzar to God. God has spoken to us in wonderful ways. But as grand and as sufficient as God's communication was throughout the Old Testament, the best, the perfect was yet to come. And the second verse of Hebrews chapter one tells us exactly what that is. It says, and now in these final days, God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The idea of the writer to the, to the Hebrews is that Jesus is the ultimate communication. He is the perfect communication of God. Let me use an, an illustration um, to, to help us to understand that. There's a story of a man who, he didn't believe in God and he was thinking about this for a while and he was thinking about how impossible it would be for mere human beings, even if God existed, and he didn't believe for a minute that God did, but even if God existed, it would be impossible for a human being to, to ever know that God existed. And he thought about it this way. He thought, he thought, you know, if I'm reading a book, if I've got a book here, and here is a character in the book, or maybe it's a play or, or something like that. And if you were to put yourself in the shoes of that character in the play, I mean, how could you possibly imagine that that character in the book or play could know anything about its author. The disconnect, the distance is just so vast and so great, it would be impossible. And so this guy felt quite comfortable in his thinking that, well, even even if God was there, what's the point? Because I couldn't possibly know him. But he continued to think on the matter. And as he did, he realized a problem with his thinking, or maybe it was revealed to him because he discovered that his analogy actually proved the very opposite of what he was trying to say. He thought about Shakespeare and Hamlet and he came to understand that if Shakespeare wanted Hamlet to know about himself, all he needed to do was write himself into the story. And then as a character, Shakespeare could walk up to the character in his story and introduce himself and tell him all about himself so that Hamlet could know everything that Shakespeare wanted him to know. And you see, when God became a man, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God wrote himself into human history. And in doing so, God provided the ultimate communication of himself. It simply couldn't get any clearer than this. And you notice something else too? Just like God accompanied all the, you know, the words of the prophets in the Old Testament by signs and wonders that proved that they came from God, Jesus' ministry was full of signs and wonders to show us that he is God. He is the ultimate communication of God, that through knowing Jesus, we can 
know God. The author of the book of Hebrews was writing to a group of Christians who were being persecuted 2,000 years ago. And he was deeply concerned for them. They had put their faith in Jesus, but now that faith was getting thin. It was kind of almost hanging by a thread. You see, they were facing troubles. They were suffering bitter persecution. And they were moving further and further away from their knowledge of God. And more importantly, they were moving further and further away from their relationship with Jesus. And so in order to counter that, throughout this letter, we discover that the writer lifts Jesus higher and higher and higher and higher. Jesus is undoubtedly the central character of the entire book. And the author reminds these people who are dear to him that if they want to know God, they need to know Jesus. They need to relate to Jesus. They need to stick with Jesus. He knows that they are facing almost overwhelming circumstances and he wants to help them in the best way that he possibly can. My friend, maybe you are facing overwhelming circumstances today as well. Certainly it feels like that for us sometimes, doesn't it? But the author is concerned for you. And the Holy Spirit knows what you need. And I am here to tell you that growing in knowledge, growing in understanding, growing in relationship with Jesus is the absolute key the foundational element in order to be able to meet the challenges that we face. We need to keep holding up Jesus. It's the most helpful thing that we can do. We place him bigger, get to know him, to see him bigger and bigger all the time. We need to build our knowledge. We need to grow in our relationship with our Lord because this will build our faith. And a stronger faith is the key to living the life of an overcomer, of experiencing joy and experiencing Christ-centered peace. As we study the book of Hebrews together, over the next little while, we're gonna discover it is a practical book. It's a book to read and to ponder and to act on. And so, in order to help us do that well, as I said before, each week throughout the series, I'm going to put together just a short list of questions, just two, three, four, something like that. Maybe a, a verse, another verse that might you know, help us to reflect and to think further on this in order for us to, to meditate on it and then to put things into practice, not just listen, but to act upon what we are learning. And so if you've indicated that you have watched the service today, I'm going to send you an email with these questions. And then if you like, you can email me back and share your thoughts with me as well. And I can pray for you as you continue to put these things into practice and you continue to go to the faith gym and grow in faith. We may or may not be suffering like the first generation of our brothers and sisters in Christ were. But no matter how difficult our circumstances might be, learning from this book of Hebrews is going to equip us to live the victorious life of the Christian. It'll be like bodybuilding for our spiritual life, building our faith. And the foundation for a growing faith is made clear in these first few verses. God has revealed himself to us in the most complete way through his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just like Lucy's discovery of Aslan in Prince Caspian, we discover that it doesn't matter how dark the battle is that we're facing. The more we come to know Jesus, I mean, the more we know about him and the more we know him personally, then the bigger and bigger and bigger he becomes in our sight. And then the more he overshadows everything that life could possibly throw at us. 
I believe God's word to you and me today is this. Jesus Christ is sufficient for us. And so we should lift Jesus higher. What is the struggle that you are facing right now? Is it health? Is it work? Is it lack of work? Is it loneliness? Is it helplessness? The answer is this. Lift Jesus higher. Get to know him more. Grow in love for him and in relationship with him. If lifting Jesus higher, if these things was the answer for our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago, and it must have been because we're here still following their story. They came to Jesus, they stuck with Jesus, and they passed it on to the next generation who has ultimately passed it on to us. If it was the answer for them, then it is the answer for us also. As we dig deeper and deeper into this amazing book, my prayer is that for you and for me, Jesus will become bigger and bigger in our sight. Bigger than he has ever seemed to us before. And as he grows, so too will our faith. Let's pray. Our God, I want to thank you that first and foremost, you are a God that is not a distant God, but a God through whom our growth, our maturity, our ability to overcome and, 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 and just live life to its fullness comes fully and completely out of a growing relationship with yourself. It comes out of intimacy. It comes out of love and out of relationship. And so I pray for each one of us, Lord, that we would commit ourselves to know you and to be growing in our relationship with you. And I would pray for anyone too who does not know you, who believes that they do not have a relationship with you, that they would come to understand, Jesus, that you are standing here and you're reaching out to them. And you're saying, you, if you were here right now, you, you'd have better words than me. But I know you would want to say something like, you know, it doesn't matter what you have done. That's not what matters to me. What matters to me what matters to you, God, is that every one of us is precious in your sight. And that the death, the death, the penalty that you paid on that cross was enough to forgive our sin. No matter how bad we think we might be, no matter how far away we might have walked away, or no matter how many times we might have turned our back on you, that you, like the father in the story of the prodigal son, would be standing and waiting with your arms open wide, just waiting for us to come home, waiting for us to turn to you. And so if somebody is here and listening and thinking that they are too far gone, I believe your word for, to them would be, come my child, I love you. I want to welcome you. Come and learn about me learn about God come relate to me relate to God and see your faith grow Lord help us help us to be growing in faith help us to have that ripped faith that is that is clear that is um, so easy to see because we live in a time of great darkness and fear and anxiety and the more and the deeper and the stronger our faith and the clearer our relationship with our Saviour is, the more that others will see you too in us. And we want them to do that. We want them to do that because we want them to find hope and we want them to find a relationship with you too. And so we commit ourselves to this. Help us and teach us as we study your word together. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you and thank you again for, for spending this time with us. Again, just let me remind you um, that article on, on the website that talks about what's happening in the world at the moment. I'd encourage you to have a read and send back your thoughts and your reflection on that to me if you have an opportunity to. And also just a reminder uh, of our prayer meeting on tomorrow night. I hope you can join us. I want to conclude with a benediction. And it comes out of the book of Hebrews. The writer says this, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that great shepherd of the sheep. May that God, may our God equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us, may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.